To begin, I would like to thank the Tennessee Human Rights Commission for holding these hearings across the state and for giving me the opportunity to present testimony today on violence against women in Tennessee. Now, the information that I'm presenting to you today is drawn from two sources provided by the Tennessee Economic Council on Women. One is the ELEOS project, which was compiled in 2011, and ELEOS stands for Economic Equity, Literacy, Independence, Opportunity, and Stability, and as indicators of social and economic well-being for Tennessee's women, it is the standard by which programs and activities of the Economic Council on Women are measured. The second is the TECW's 2013 study, excuse me, the Economic Impact of Violence Against Women, and I have for um, all of the um, commission members a copy of the full report as well as the executive summary and everything I have to say today has been pulled from the pages of these documents so they're just going to serve as my written testimony so in this um, 2013 study that I mentioned um, violent acts against Tennessee women were shown to be so prevalent and so damaging that they likely cost regular Tennesseans $886,171,950 or more annually. The majority of this expense is manifest in tax dollars and health care payments, but other expenditures such as charity, lost wages, workplace expenses, and inefficiencies played significant roles as well. Additionally, while the, TC, while the TECW could not provide an exact estimate, it appears that domestic and sexual violence committed against women likely influenced the needs of the children who received a majority of the Department of Children's Services operational spending, which itself totals almost $530 million a year. So Tennesseans pay a heavy cost for violence against women through law enforcement and county jails, our judicial system, children's services, medical and mental health services, social service providers, and also a loss of workplace productivity, private enterprise, and wages. Women who suffer physical abuse spend 42% more on health care than non-abused women, which ultimately even causes insurance premiums to rise as a result of successive cohorts of thousands of women experiencing high care utilization lasting 10 to 15 years following their victimization. More shocking than this annual cost to the community, which in truth exceeds more than $1 billion per year. Can you imagine what the state of Tennessee could do with an extra billion dollars a year? More shocking than that is the comprehensive and devastating impact that these crimes have on women and girls in Tennessee. Some costs are simply too difficult, if not impossible, to ascertain, such as the opportunity cost of these crimes, as in the unknown achievement of women whose healthy lives have been jeopardized by violence. Included with these findings in this report are details about domestic violence, sex trafficking, and sexual assault in Tennessee, and recommendations to strengthen education and prevention efforts. The results have staggering implications for Tennessee, and most especially for its women and girls. Tennessee consistently ranks the highest in the nation in the number of women killed by men. Estimated to target women in 70 to 80 percent of cases and measuring in excess of 82,000 incidents annually in this state, domestic and sexual violence foster dependency and isolation, they derail careers and educations and personal development, and their effects create a global cost to the community by dealing significant immediate damage and then immense lasting trauma to one in three Tennessee women in their lifetime. Of the many themes that were revealed in the TECW's research, the following four items I think are the most prominent. First, is that domestic violence is not a family matter with limited impact 
on the well-being of others outside the family unit. It is, in fact, one of the most debilitating and prevalent crimes in our society, and it perpetually extracts costs, both immediate and long-term, from every single one of us. Domestic violence is the number one cause of injury to women, and the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation reports that more than half of all crimes against persons in Tennessee are domestic violence crimes. It's also the most underreported crime, as research suggests that only one out of every four acts of domestic violence against women are actually reported. Women are also at greater risk than men for stalking, and the number of women reporting this kind of intimidation and victimization continue to rise. Among all the women that I know and know well enough to discuss these topics, every single one has experienced some form of sexual harassment, intimidation, assault, or abuse. It seems almost to be a universal female experience. Second, prostitution is not a profession that is willingly chosen. It is a suffering of last resort that desperate women and children are forced into or fall back on to survive. It is a heinous form of modern slavery perpetrated by predatory traffickers and reckless purchasers of forced sex. Prostitution challenges the humanity of the individuals and the culture of the community. Third, it's in the best interest of all Tennesseans to recognize that a child should not be born into a unique likelihood of rape, abuse, or violation because of gender. Crimes that victimize women in such tremendous volume and specificity have compounding effects on our society and economy, and by derailing the lives of so many, they serve to impede an entire gender's collective ability to achieve its full socioeconomic potential. And lastly, our state's capability to respond to these crimes is increasingly capable, with law enforcement, courts, and social service providers growing both in strength and sophistication each year. But prevention methods are nearly non-existent. There are many recommendations per, for prevention of violence against women, including education, recovery-oriented funding, control-oriented offender counseling, healthcare identification, community awareness, trafficking rehabilitation, and collaboration between public, private, and even faith-based faith -based outreach. Breaking the insidious cycle of domestic and sexual violence that is passed from parent to child by abuse, either experienced or witnessed, must be a foremost mission of Tennessee's combined resources. Educational programs that discuss healthy and unhealthy relationships, gender or non-gender roles, and promote individual health in spite of victimization must be created and funded on a large scale. Efforts should be directed toward early intervention, reaching children in the community and in grade school. Programs should continue throughout high school and college where possible, addressing issues such as date rape. Advocates should encourage our state administration to consider how best to involve the Tennessee Department of Education, the Board of Regents, and the Higher Education Commission in ongoing efforts to fight these crimes. While conducting their research, the TECW discovered that schools actually tend not to be aware of orders of protection and how they might impact a parent's permission to make contact with a student. Localities and school officials should have in place a method by which such information can be shared in a timely manner. <coughs> Financial literacy, job skills development, and confidence building are just a few of the services of which survivors are in critical need. State and local efforts should be made to develop comprehensive recovery resources for survivors who are working to rebuild their lives. <coughs> Research indicates that domestic violence is a crime rooted in control. And as a result, existing prevention and rehabilitation efforts that are directed at offenders tend to be directed toward anger management. They simply just seem to have a low rate of success. So counseling program providers and government agencies should collaborate in an effort to develop effective program content that addresses the root cause 
of coercion and abuse. <coughs> Insufficient administrative policies and lack of adequate means to document domestic violence related injuries puts medical advisor puts medical providers at a disadvantage when they do identify a violent incident because the healthcare industry does not have a coherent way to receive or retrieve that information, so it gets lost. Current procedural terminology, or CPT, put in place by the American Medical Association would be one method to establish a coherent usable system. So healthcare officials and social service providers and other advocates should collaborate in an effort to encourage the adoption of CPT coding relevant to violent crime against women. Consistency in staff response can also contribute to the identification of abuse victims and healthcare and other service providers should consider ways in which staffing can be consistent. Efforts should be made at the local and state level to promote awareness of sex trafficking among proprietors of hotels, motels, and apartment complexes. State and local officials, advocates, and service providers can develop multilingual outreach materials to bolster awareness about domestic and sexual violence. And additional consideration should be given to tailoring outreach specifically to urban, suburban, and rural audiences. Distrust of authorities, addiction, and other factors that contribute to minor sex trafficking victims' desire to return to the trafficker are primary challenges to the prosecution of these sex traffickers and also to the rehabilitation of the victims. So legislation should be considered at the state level that would permit authorities to detain victims under the age of 18 for a period of 14 days or more. These are frequently referred to as safe harbor provisions and it would permit advocates an opportunity to begin addressing the needs of the victims who would otherwise have as little as a day of being taken off the streets. Demand for sex is the primary enabler in the commercial sex market. Following the recent passage of laws to significantly increase the penalty for purchasing sex acts, especially from a minor, there still remains a need to interrupt a purchaser's willingness to make that risk purchasing sex again. So advocates can work with the state and local governments to collaborate to that, possibly within the framework of the trafficking coordination and service delivery plan that they're already putting into place. In Knox County here, we have a family justice center, which is basically a one-stop shop for women seeking assistance to remove themselves and any children they may have from an abusive or predatory situation. The TECW applauds and supports these centers, but cautions against the possible public perception that they can replace existing service networks. Presently, there's a feeling that hundreds of victims across the state are thought to be turned away or underserved due to shortages of resources. The TECW also applauds the work being done by the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation and the Tennessee General, General Assembly to pass legislation that will be critical to the state's fight against trafficking and the work that the TBI is doing to train more than 5,200 first responders and what they're calling first identifiers across the state to better identify and respond to human trafficking. So both locally and at the state level, law enforcement officials medical and mental care providers, social service providers, educators, insurance providers, government officials, members of private enterprise, participants in the legal system, and others should work together to establish <coughs> regular meetings in which community needs related to domestic and sexual violence can be identified and prevention and response and recovery efforts can be established. In my role as a county commissioner here in Knox, we're working with our law department to form a task force that would begin to address locally some of these issues, particularly those around um, addiction and the victims of violence against women. So um, that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, 
I'll do my best to answer them, and if I can't answer them, I'll take your name and find you the answer and get back to you. And I also left a stack of my cards on the table over there if anybody needs to contact me um, for any follow-up. Thank you so much for uh, including the Tennessee Economic Council on Women. Um, I wanted you to know that everyone can have access to the report if you go on the council's website. It's TennesseeWomen.org and the report is there and I can say that it was amazing having attended some of those hearings across the state that the issue of violence no one really knew how serious it really was and particularly the human trafficking so it's something that we all need to pay attention to thank you I think we have one question and that is in general can you talk about the sort of daycare the, the, the different types of daycare services that are available for working moms? Or is that a big question? <laughs> um, I can partially answer it, but I can get more information and word it onto the commission. All right, that'll be um, That is actually one area where I feel like we're really lacking is in affordable childcare for parents who work. Um, there are a lot of parents who are having to divide up their time as a couple um, where one works during the day and one works at night because even on two incomes they can't afford uh, decent child care while they're working. And that puts a tremendous strain on families, um, which can lead to um, instances of, of abuse and victimization. So um, that is one area where we really need to be doing better, particularly as uh, single parents may be entering the workforce um, and without proper skills, so they need child care not just for work, but also for the education process. So that's definitely an issue. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. I have a few housekeeping rules, and I have six minutes to answer your questions. Because this room is set to be booked at noon, set to be occupied at noon by a different group. Let me I, I recognize a couple of people. One is the Vice Chancellor for Diversity at the University of Tennessee, Ricky Hall. How are you doing? You're welcome. And the other is former Commissioner Ruby Miller from Oak Ridge, who is with us. And she's that commercial. Who is that, honey? <laughs> it's the State Farm lady. <laughs> Three in the morning? <laughs> anyway, everybody knows Ruby is the State Farm lady. <laughs> um, there was one question for the mayor and for the city, and it was, could someone please talk about how underserved neighborhoods can be integrated more into the downtown redevelopment public policy planning process? And I can give you a minute. I think Mark said, Mark Rigsby said he could just talk about that or refocus something. Mark? Come on up. So you can be on the mic. Thanks. And then I have two more quick questions. I think we can get through them. Well, we want to simply say that downtown is a neighborhood like all of our other communities, and we do incorporate downtown into all of our planning. We are very inclusive in terms of our community organizations and that there is a neighborhood advisory council and the council involved neighborhoods, which includes all of our neighborhood organizations. And any time that we have a uh, special project or anything we're doing, we do have public input process. In fact, we're having our citizen public input process on Tuesday, April the 8th at 5.30 at the council and neighborhood one. Thank you. Um, there were two other questions. One says, could you address the issue of age discrimination if such an issue exists? It exists. That's the short answer. If you're interested in more details, 12% uh, of our complaints are age discrimination complaints, so we get about 50 plus. Some of those may be straight age. They could be age and disability. There is litigation currently underway, and this is an EEOC.gov issue. If you go there, the Texas Roadhouse litigation issue, Texas Roadhouse is not hiring persons over 40. In the front side, on the front side of the house, an EEOC is litigating that issue. There is no settlement, so no one's made a decision, but that's the allegation. And EEOC is litigating that. It is on their front page of their home, so you can go there. That's 
Texas Roadhouse, and you'll see it. Uh, in 2011, EEOC got about 10,000 plus age cases, just FYI, yes, it exists. As America ages, there are many, many more issues that are coming up, and it is one of those issues in which people don't always report it, uh, depending on the issues. And then finally, there's a question about the future of the Tennessee Human Rights Commission. Will there be a name change? I don't know. <laughs> there is an amendment in the House that dropped the name change. Representative Matlock, it was in committee, state government committee in the House this morning. The change was to move Tennessee Human Rights Commission from a 15-member commission to a nine-member commission, two appointed by the House, two appointed by the Senate, and five by the governor. We currently have 15 commissioners all appointed by the governor, which gets to the next question. Will there be a change to the focus of the commission? On paper and in law, there is no, uh, there is no amendments to change our focus. However, there's a Senate bill that still has a name change. The hearing is tomorrow. We'll know whether there is an amendment to that or not. As they say, stay tuned. <laughs> Finally, let me thank staff. Let me thank Dina Wise from the UT, UT Department of Extension for assisting us. And let me thank all of you all for being here. We're going to vacate this room. We'll be congregating out here in the lobby, hopefully not making too much noise. But again, thank you all for being here, and we appreciate you.
and to encourage
people who may be home